Hey everyone, I'm Melissa from Knitting the Stash, and this is episode 133 in the series. Welcome back to the Yarn Room. It's lovely to see you. Uh, I'm coming to you from New York still, and it is promising to be a pretty Sunday here. We've got some blue skies, some sunshine, maybe in the 60s, so I hope it's good wherever you are. Uh, if you're coming back to the podcast, welcome back. It's lovely to see all of you. I've so enjoyed our Zoom sessions together, uh, t chatting with you over in Ravelry, chatting with you here on the comments on YouTube. Uh, there's just a really lovely community, and I just so appreciate all the support, and it's wonderful. Um, and I have to say a special thank you to the Patreon. So, um, Nargis, thanks for supporting the podcast through Patreon, especially. Uh, and keep up all the comments, please. I love getting your emails. Um, try to answer your questions if I can, or send you to the right resources. Uh, and come join us on Saturday for our Zooms. Uh, we Zoom at 2 o'clock Eastern time, and I'd be happy to send you that information if you want to email me at knittingthestash at gmail.com. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. Uh, this is usually a podcast about sweaters, like garment knitting, garment design, garment modification, but occasionally I knit something else. <laughs> so today I will be talking about the Moria scarf. Uh, that's my finished object. I'm in between sweaters and uh, I'm actually enjoying a couple of test knits right now for the new Shorn yarn, which is coming out very soon. So. For those of you who have been following for a long time, you know that each year, usually, though the cycle has gotten a little expanded in the pandemic, but each year I usually bring you a new small batch yarn um, that I helped to create. So of course there's the Flock Farm Yarn Shop where I have all kinds of small batch yarns from around the United States, and then there's my Shorn yarns, which are um, specific to me and I'm pretty happy about them. So Shorn 4 is coming soon. This is what it looks like. It's a beautiful natural gray. It is, I'm getting the tags already for it. Um, it is a Coriadale and Coriadale Teeswater blend. So it has, it's a beautiful kind of like medium weight fleece. You know, you think about Coriadale as a good multi-purpose fleece fiber. Uh, and then Teeswater adds a little bit of luster and, you know, long wool kind of strength to it. So it's a beautiful yarn. I've been knitting with it because I put together a pattern for this year's launch. And I'm also knitting with it because I'm knitting up two patterns from some wonderful new designers that I'm so excited to feature on here very soon. We're getting close. Uh, if you're interested in getting your hands on some of this yarn, I'm going to do a subscriber pre-sale. So if you go over to knittingthestash.com, uh, which is where you can find everything, basically, uh, and sign up for the, the newsletter, the email newsletter. You'll get a special, um, what do you call it, like a little uh, a link to a special place in the shop where only subscribers will have access to this yarn. So that is going to be going out, I think, in the next week, week and a half, something like that. So get over there, subscribe, so you'll be the first to know and the first to have access to this. The kits, which I usually do, uh, are gonna come out probably mid-October. So that'll be a separate public sale, but I will let uh, subscribers know first so that you can get over there and check out the kits. We have a hat, we have a cowl, we have a beautiful wrap. All of those are coming up with these kits and I'm so excited about the whole process. It's just, it's so much fun to work with designers, to work with a new yarn and yeah, I mean, you can see from my face, I'm like, it's one of my favorite things to do and it only happens once a year. So <laughs> I get to enjoy this once a year, especially. Uh, so that's Shorn 4 and it will be out hopefully in the next week and a half to subscribers and then the kits will be available mid-October exciting stuff. Uh, this was a uh, fleece that uh, we helped pasture, uh, not last summer, but the summer before, because, you know, there's a long delay in mill times with creation of yarn. Uh, so we helped pasture the sheep in the summer, and the fleece is still from my friend Kathy's beautiful sheep, um, and we milled it in Michigan, and it's just, it's going to be, it's just, I'm so happy about it every time it happens. This one happens to be a three-ply DK weight yarn, so it's about 250 yards for every 100 grams or three and a half ounces if you're looking to get some come some of the specs for the yarn. But anyway, head over to knittingthestash.com, sign up for the newsletter, and you'll be the first to have access to the kind of pre-sale before the kits go live uh, sometime in mid-October. 
So on today's episode, I have a bunch of different things for you. As I said, we're going to talk about grafting, and I will introduce you to the Moria Scarf by Stitch Gremlin. I also have a giveaway at the end. Uh, Karen of S Diva Designs has uh, donated one of her beautiful project bags for the podcast giveaway, and her bags are in the shop, in the Flock Farm Yarn Shop over at KnittingTheStash.com, and they are on sale right now. So for very sh a very short amount of time they're going to be on sale 40% off if you can believe it and at the end of this uh, episode we're going to do a giveaway for one of the sweater size bags they're beautiful handmade bags by Karen who's up in Canada and I want to say a special thank you to Karen for having her bags in the shop and for sponsoring this giveaway so thank you Karen so let's jump in with the Moria scarf, and this is part of our TV knitting cal for the year. Uh, I do cal's uh, knit alongs for the entirety of a year. Usually it's September to September, or October to October. I know the dates are weird. What are you going to do? Uh, and this year's theme is TV knitting. So anything that has to do with TV or movies, uh, whether it's the yarn, whether it's the pattern, whether it's a screenshot you took from your favorite movie, any of that stuff's eligible. And we were talking on the Zoom yesterday and Kristen actually suggested, what about books? You know, like knitting that's based on books. And I thought, that's kind of cool. Why not? Let's be as expansive and inclusive as possible. Uh, so thank you for that suggestion, Kristen. And we are including anything, TV, knitting, books, movies, all that kind of stuff. So knitting that's related to media. We'll say that. That's kind of the, that's the new version of the cow. It's like media knitting. Uh, you can think of it as the TV cow if you want to. Uh, either way, this is the Moria scarf. So it's based on uh, Lord of the Rings. And you can see that, I think, in the design. This is like the gates of Moria in the cables. I'll try to bring it up close here to the camera. You can see the gates coming through there. Now, I made some modifications, as always. I always make modifications. <laughs> If you've been following for a while, that's like what you expect. So the gate is missing the a little bit of the lower portion. So this, this portion of the gate should be bigger according to the pattern, but uh, I was limited on my yarn. So I decided to make that portion of the gate a little bit smaller among other things. But I think you get the sense, you, cable work here is creating this beautiful kind of archway. And the archway is on either side of the scarf. So I kind of like those scarf patterns where the actual cool stuff happens toward the bottom of the scarves because that's the part that you actually see on somebody. You know, like if I have this and I'm, you know, wrapped up in it, that's the portion that you're going to actually see. Whereas if I have, you know, beautiful knitting stitches behind my neck, I mean, they're gorgeous, but you can't really see them. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of in love with uh, scarf patterns that uh, leave the cool stuff towards the bottom. Right. So this was designed by Stitch Gremlin, and that is M over on Ravelry. Uh, and M has a bunch of, a couple of other really lovely patterns up. Um, and I'm impressed with the clarity of this one, written instructions and charted instructions, easy to follow, a bunch of different options. So if you wanted to knit this from one end to the other without seaming or grafting, there's an option for that. And if you want to knit half and half and then graft the whole thing together, there's an option for that. Uh, so it's an easy pattern to follow, really fun to knit. I got into the charts and totally loved the way that M uh, integrated uh, these different kinds of cables into the center of the gate and the arches that are running all along the side of the gate. So I just really like it as a pattern. Uh, and I'm a big fan of Lord of the Rings, so I mean, that's <laughs> there you so go. I'll say a few things about this uh, scarf and the modifications I made before we get into the grafting. Uh, one of the things uh, to note about this one, this version for me at least, is that I was using a yarn that was just a stash yarn. This is a beautiful kind of purple gray uh, tweedy yarn that came to me from Albina McLaughlin uh, in one of our yarn exchanges before the pandemic and before all the postage stuff got so weird. Uh, we were sending each other really fun yarns. And this was um, a couple of balls of yarn that I think she might have suggested I use for one of her hats that I was testing. And I didn't. I ended up using a different yarn. Um, and so this was just sitting in my stash. It's beautiful. It's wooly. I think it's a Donegal tweed. And Albina, if you're watching, let me know. I need to text you about this. <laughs> and so I didn't really know how much yarn I had. There were no tags. There were no ball bands. There was no information. I just knew it was wool. And I knew that, uh, you know, I had relatively equal size balls of yarn. Because this is half and half, if you knit it that way. So I just kind of went for it. 
It turns out one of my two balls of yarn was slightly underweight, you know, from the other one. So I think I had, let's just say I had 93 grams of one and 83 grams of the other. I don't remember what it was, but it, you know, it was off by just enough that when I finished one side and cast on the other side, I just didn't have quite enough yarn to knit this to the length that is called for in the pattern. So you can see it's a little bit shortened. You know, it's not like a long, long scarf. You know, it sits down almost to my waist. Uh, it'll be perfect for tucking into a coat. You know, just do this, put your coat on. Awesome. It doesn't have all that extra stuff hanging down below. Uh, but it is a little short and that is because of the yarn shortage that I ran into. So this was knit in two pieces and uh, basically I got to the, I finished one to the end of the, the ball that I had and then decided, okay, well I'll use that many rows for the other side. And I knit the other side and did not have enough. So I ended up pulling out yarn from one side to give to the other. And that's how I ended up getting uh, an equal scarf for each side. It did involve a little bit of pulling out and it was also uh, I was kind of glad that I hadn't done those extra rows down here uh, on the lower gate because that meant that I was saving yarn for the other side. So basically it was a little bit of like you know rob from one side to pay the other but it worked out and I'm pretty happy with the the result here. Uh, I do love the texture of this scarf. There's um, some beautiful kind of textured stitches in here, uh, flanking the, the cables that go up. And I've seen some versions of this, some project pages, where someone actually didn't switch charts and just simply uh, repeated this kind of uh, gate kind of infrastructure up here and again over here. And they, they made it work. Like they did some paralleling with the patterns, but it just created more of this kind of texture all over the whole scarf, which was really kind of cool. It was a kind of a cool effect. So, so let's talk about the grafting portion and I'm going to show you the back where the graft actually happens. It happens right here down the center of the back and you can see I was grafting in pattern. So if I, if you really pull it out, you can probably start to see the graft, which you shouldn't be able to see because my tension should have been better, but I didn't go back and fix my tension as well as I could have. So that's the graft. And you can see that I was grafting in pattern. Uh, so I was, you know, making sure that the purl stitches look like purl stitches and the knit stitches look like knit stitches all the way down uh, from the border all the way up to the other border. So when you scrunch it up like this, you can see that it actually sits just, it's kind of like a woolly worm head hat in a way because of the guard or the, uh, pearls and the knits uh, lining up, but you can see that it sits in pattern and you wouldn't really notice uh, too much about the grafting if I had adjusted my tension just perfectly, but I didn't because I was kind of in a hurry. Anyway, uh, grafting in pattern is a tricky thing to do and the first time I ever did it, it was with the Stornoway Throw Blanket and uh, this has come, this has still come back around to uh, I'm not going to say haunt me, but I'm going to say it's the kind of project that just keeps giving. So this was the Stornoway Throw Blanket. I can't even hold it up and show you the whole thing, but it's a massive wool blanket, right? And it has just a basic texture for the whole center of the blanket. And then you cast on um, stitches on the edge, like a provisional cast on, and you work this cabled border vertically all around the blanket. So basically you have your blanket and then you provisionally cast on your stitches and work vertically, you know, perpendicular to the blanket, your uh, border, your cabled border. And then you get to the corners, you miter them, you go the other way, and then you miter them and you go the other way, right? All the way around the blanket. So of course, this required a lot of figuring out and the pattern itself, it had some issues. It wasn't perfectly helpful with all of the ways and means of doing things. So I did post a couple of tutorials and since then, this is the kind of like why it's been hanging around. People still go to those videos and that old blog post and uh, request help. And at this point, I'm so far from the project that I can't really remember all of everything that I did. Uh, but luckily there's been this kind of continual generational community of people over there <laughs> who will take up the torch and uh, you know if someone asks a question someone who's knit the blanket more recently will answer the questions and help out which is a uh, lovely that's <laughs> lovely I love to see that kind of thing happening so you can see that the corners had to be mitered which was tricky as heck when I was first learning cables and I wanted to show you the graft because I was thinking to myself, when did I graft in pattern first? And this was it. Talk about tricky, right? 
so it took me a while to go back through the blanket and I actually this should be reassuring for every knitter out there this is a project that's got to be six or seven years old at this point I mean it's a it's an old project it's been used I would you know pull this blanket out and sleep on it under the couch whatever uh, and I was looking at each corner trying to find my graft and I actually had some trouble finding my graft. So for anyone who's worried that your graft is just gonna be glaringly obvious and bad and you know, you're gonna find it years later and you're gonna stare at it and think about it a lot, it took me a long time to find this graft and a lot of good light. So let that be a reassurance to you. <laughs> so here's the graft and it is on the flat portion. You can see right across here. That The only thing that gives it away, I think, is that the cables are slightly off by like one stitch over that way, right? Otherwise it's, I'm gonna say it's pretty darn good for a first graft in pattern in a cable uh, blanket, right? It's a little hard to see because of the dark yarn, but I think you can barely see right there, okay? So it took me a while to find that graft and that made me feel pretty good. <laughs> you can see it if you're looking for it. The tension is a little funny and the, the knit stitches don't, quite line up for the cables, you know, like one is a little bit higher or lower than the other. I'm going to take it because it was a first attempt and it was pretty, pretty darn good. Uh, so with this one, I wanted to spend some time actually thinking about grafting because it's, it's a technique that I really like. I've done a lot of grafting on sock toes. I'm sure you have too with the Kitchener stitch. But the thing about grafting to me is that I wanted to be able to know how it works. This is one of my things, right? I want to know how it works and why it works. So I finally found a tutorial that cleared the whole thing up for me. Now, everybody learns differently. So maybe a different tutorial would do, you know, this have the same effect on you. And I would love it if we could compile our tutorials. So I'll add a Ravelry thread in the group and I'd love to hear your comments below. What tutorials have helped you see knitting in a new way? You know, what, what has been the breakthrough moment for you with the blog post or the YouTube video or whatever it's been, I'd love to know. For me, it was this video by Queenie Knits on YouTube, and it's just it's called How to Graft in Pattern Easily. <laughs> Go figure, right? So I did a little looking around, and Queenie Knits is Jody Mom on Ravelry. She has a Ravelry page with lots of different projects, and she doesn't have that many YouTube videos up, but the YouTube videos she has up are incredibly helpful. So I would I'm gonna link to it in the show notes below if anybody wants to check it out. So thank you. Queenie Knits, Jody. If you're out there, you just made it all clear to me. It was like seeing through the matrix. So the thing that I thought Jody explained really well in her video is that all you're looking at when you're grafting are the next two stitches on your needle. That's all that really matters. You know, once you do your little setup, you know, beginning of a Kitchener, where you have to like go on one side and go on the other to secure your yarn. Okay, you've secured your yarn. All you're looking at are the next two stitches on the front and on the back of your work, right? So we know that if we're grafting two things together, we're thinking about them and how we're going to get them to line up. And oftentimes they're held on our needles like this. So there's, a, there's one side and the other side. And usually the right sides are facing as you're grafting, right? I don't know if this is helping, but <laughs> I'm thinking about grafting and I think about it being folded over and like you're grafting one side of the other. And this point where my fingertips it are, that's where you're creating your knits or your purl stitches, right? And that's where your tension has to be better than mine on this one. Um, but if you're only looking at the next two stitches on your front needle or your back needle, then it becomes very simple all of a sudden and you're not, caught up in the like, oh, I need to think about this. And then like, there aren't a million things going on. There's not the Kitchener repeat in your head. There's not, you can basically look at any pattern and know how to graft it, which was like mind blown, right? Okay, so you have to watch Queenie's video to get the full explanation. But very basically, she explains that if you have, let's just look at the front of the work. If you have two knit stitches that you're faced with, then you wanna make sure just like in Kitchener, that the direction of your sewing has to change. So you would knit into the first stitch, pull it off, and then purl into the second stitch, right? So you had two knit stitches, so two of the same. So your sewing has to be in different directions. So you knit the first, purl the second, right? Same thing with two purl stitches, right? If your stitches are the same, your sewing has to be two different directions. So you'd purl the first stitch, pull it off, and then knit the second stitch. This is basic Kitchener, right? If you've done Kitchener before, you know that. You're like 
two knit stitches, two purl stitches, you know, exactly the mantra that you're supposed to be repeating to yourself over and over again, right? But what if you have a knit stitch followed by a purl stitch or a purl stitch followed by a knit stitch, right? That's a lot of times what happens when you're working in pattern, you're trying to graft in pattern. Very simple. This isn't lace or cables. This is just knits and purls. So if you happen to have a knit and a purl, you have two different stitches, right? So one's a knit, one's a purl. And your sewing needs to be in the same direction then because your stitches are different, sewing, same direction. So you would knit the first stitch, knit the second stitch, but leave it on the needle. See that? Oh my gosh. If you have a purl and a knit, same kind of thing, two different stitches. So your sewing needs to be in the same direction. So you would purl the first purl stitch, drop it off, and then purl the second stitch and leave it on, right? I'm not sure if my weird finger uh, <laughs> display explanation is helping you, uh, but you got to go watch Queenie Knit's video on YouTube. It changed my life. So I just want it to change yours if it's at all possible. Knowing how to graft by just looking at the next two stitches on your needles is so freeing. It doesn't mean you have to mantra and you don't have to be saying any kind of Kitchener mantra in your head. You're just thinking, what do these next two stitches require? Now, if you really want to get into it, I found a couple of other sources for you. One is an excellent interweave knits article called why every serious knitter should know how to graft in pattern okay i know the title is a little bossy let's let that go it's by kathleen K uh, kubley and it came out in 2021 and it goes through in epic detail how to think about grafting if you're looking at lace and cables and you know all kinds of other different things awesome, right? I'm like breaking out the swatches right now, ready to try to graft stuff together. Then the other thing I found was a course, a quick online course uh, taught by Joni Conglio, and she teaches lace grafting made easy. So the cool thing about that class is that she goes through the basics of grafting first and then gets into some of the really complicated stuff like lace and how to create lace stitches if you're grafting, like how to create yarn overs if you're grafting, how to create, you know, all kinds of different decreases while you're grafting. Again, mind blown. So I've signed up for that course. I'm gonna break out my swatches. I wanna just see this through. <laughs> I'm really just, I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that you really could, instead of learning a, a kind of like um, little mantra, like you could actually learn how and why something works and then understand it to the point where you can look at two pieces of fabric and think about how they would need to be stitched together. I think that's awesome. So if anybody else wants to come on this grafting journey with me, <laughs> feel free. I'm going to start a Ravelry thread because I'm so curious about how other people graft, what sources they like to use, um, you know, other print or video resources, you know, trying to compile this big thing about grafting so that maybe we can all learn a little bit more about how stitches go together and what knitted fabric actually like looks like and how it works. It's fascinating stuff. All right, one more bit of knitting trivia for you, or wool trivia, I suppose. I didn't mention this at the beginning. I just forgot that I wanted to talk about it because um, I'm reading this book called Secondhand Travels in the New Global Garage Sale by Adam Mintner. And a lot of it is about textiles and the textile trades and used textiles and where they're going around the globe and how different this global textile trade is actually nowadays than it used to be even 20 years ago. It's just absolutely fascinating. And he takes you all around the world, not only the US, but Mexico, J uh, Japan, uh, Nigeria, like all around the world, fascinating stuff. And the chapter I just got to is about um, wool recycling. So textiles being chopped up into shoddy. And I was reminded of Anna Moore Sunbao's book, Everyday Knitting in which she takes over a shoddy factory and finds all of these old garments in the rag pile that were going to be turned into shoddy uh, and basically she put together an epic history of these knits that she found uh, in the rag pile. I love this book. It's kind of hard to come by. A fascinating read about the history of textiles, um, but equally so is this Adam Mintner book about um, the textile trade globally, and especially this particular chapter on wool and wool shoddy. So shoddy is uh, that material that's made by shredding up wool, and then it's often used to stuff mattresses or the be the batting in quilts, or I mean, if it's better stuff, if it's better quality, it could even be remade into uh, material for blankets and things like that. So it's a real part of the recycling of 
uh, textiles, and it's a long tradition that goes back, you know, centuries, but uh, it's kind of fallen out of fashion a little bit now because there's, as he's arguing in this book, there's such a global interest in uh, the new, because the new is often so cheap nowadays that the used is, it's, it doesn't even have as much value as it once did because you can buy new things cheaper than you can buy used things. Anyway, uh, if you're interested in that whole line of research, I would highly recommend Anamore Sunbell's book. Um, she often gives lectures. She appeared, I think, on an uh, Arnie and Carlos episode recently uh, that I saw on YouTube. I don't know how recent it was, but I think she, she was on one of their episodes. Uh, I went to um, a wonderful talk by her that Patricia sponsored. Um, and anyway, she's she makes the rounds, and you can you can hear interviews with her if you can't get a hold of her book. But this history of the rag pile and shoddy, and the way that it's actually still happening, usually not in places like the U.S., um, but it's still being produced. Fascinating stuff. So I just wanted to put in that little textile bit of history for you in case you were uh, interested in finding some new reading. Right, this Adam Mintner book, uh, secondhand travels in the global garage sale, might be for you. So let's turn to the giveaway that's been sponsored by Karen of S Diva Designs. And I have my own S Diva Designs bag here. I use this for sweaters because it's nice and big, uh, hand stitched. It has little pockets in it. Actually, I have a lace project in here right now, but it has um, pockets on the inside for storing needles or patterns or, you know, notions and things like that. Ooh, there's like all kinds of fun things in here. The yarn tags that I've been using. Uh, drawstring on the top and a little carry handle here. They're flat bottomed, so you can actually sit them down if you're knitting. Mine might probably has Tink and Millie hair on it at this point, uh, but you can set them on the floor or in a chair next to you and they just sit upright because they have a nice flat bottom. So this is my S Diva Designs bag and uh, Karen has generously donated one of these bags for a giveaway. So a sweater size bag in this same pattern, the bees, the beautiful bees, uh, is the giveaway for this time around. So if you'd like to be entered in the giveaway, let us know what's in your knitting bag right now. <laughs> if you have a project bag uh, and you have an on-the-go project, let us know what's in your project bag. Uh, or, or if you don't have anything on the go right now, maybe tell us what you'd like to put in this project bag, what project you're thinking about working on. Uh, so thanks to Karen for donating a beautiful project bag uh, for the giveaway. I can't wait to get this out into the world for someone else to enjoy. And if you'd like to pick up a bag uh, direct from the shop, uh, we have smaller uh, sock or accessory bags in the shop that also have the drawstring and the flat bottom. They are nice and small, perfect for little accessories, socks, uh, things like that. And they do have, uh, these are really cool because they have a couple of different, they're divided in the middle. So they have a divider in here and the divider actually has a zipper. So you could keep all of your little notions or yarn tags or things like that right in your bag. It's like built into the bag and there's a divider. So if you have two small projects, maybe you have one skein over here and one over here or color work with two different skeins, uh, they'd be kind of perfect for working with that. So that's the small bags that we have in the shop and the large bags you've already seen lots of different fun fabrics this is uh, a beautiful hillside fabric we have i think there's just one of these left beautiful flowers in the shop uh, and some more honeybees so yeah those are 40 percent off right now thanks karen <laughs> and thank you so much for donating uh, the bag for the giveaway. Let us know what's in your current project bag or what you'd like to see in this project bag in the comments below over on Ravelry in the thread I'll open up. Uh, either way, that'll get you entered to win and I'll do a draw randomly in the next couple of weeks. Um, yeah, so thanks Karen for donating the bag. I think that's about it for today. So thanks for hanging out with me in the yarn room, checking out the new Moria scarf, talking about grafting, uh, and I will open up those Ravelry threads so we can keep the conversation going. If you want to join the Saturday Zoom, remember to email me at knittingthestash at gmail.com. We always have new people coming in and out there. It's wonderful to meet them, and the group is very welcoming, and we love to meet new people and see new faces over there. And if you're looking for me, you can check out knittingthestash.com for all my online classes, the Flock Farm Yarn Shop, all the good stuff is over there, knittingthestash.com. I will see you in a couple of weeks. Take care, and I'll enjoy your knitting. I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.